Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Angela Mackey, and welcome to Ask the Mayo Mom. I'm a pediatrician at Mayo Clinic Children's Center in Rochester, Minnesota, and host of this show about pediatric health topics. Today, we are discussing learning disabilities in children. Joining us for this discussion is Dr. Tanya Brown, a clinical neuropsychologist at Mayo Clinic Children's Center. She is the chair of the Neurocognitive Di Disorders Division within the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology at Mayo Clinic. Remember, if you're listening live, we want to hear from you today, especially about our topic, learning disabilities. So do your best um, to try and we'll do our best to try to answer your questions live today. Um, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for joining me. I'm stumbling through my words today. Maybe I do need some neurocognitive examination. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> no where we can help you with that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sounds good. Um, well, I, learning disabilities are a really important topic, so I'm glad we're going to shed light on them. I feel like there's even, even amongst like pediatricians, I feel like we still don't have a great understanding about how we should be picking up and screening children for learning disabilities. So um, let's dive into the topic today. Can you help to define for us what are learning disabilities? Absolutely. Well, I can try. I mean, there's a federal definition, which I'm actually going to read because I think it's important and it guides each of the states as well, oh, okay. um, where it's they, they call it a disorder in where one or more of the basic psychological processes involved in understanding or using spoken written or written language. Um, it's an imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, or do mathematical calculations, including conditions such as perceptual disabilities, um, minimal brain dysfunction, dyslexia, and dysgraphia. And so it's interesting because a lot of those terms that they put in the definition, the federal definition and on the state website are things that we often feel like parents come to us and say, the schools won't help me with dyslexia, for example. Mm -hmm. So they throw in medical terminology there. But, mm -hmm. So essentially, though, I mean, in layman's terms, a learning disability or disorder is when a child is not learning at a rate that we would consider expected for their abilities, um, given kind of the a level playing field. Do we know what what causes that that difference in in their abilities to process this, this information and learn things? Lots of things, of course, like most of the psychological or cognitive issues, they can absolutely be related to a child's medical condition. So uh, uh, genetic or biological, um, you know, aberration of development. So something that just throws development off. Um, mm -hmm. They're often genetically linked. So frequently we'll do a lot of questioning of folks to see, is there a history of learning disorder in your family history? Um, children with speech and language disorders, I find often have increased incidence of like reading disorders or the or written language disorders, those things that affect are affected by speech and language development. Um, and so there are lots of kind of cognitive issues that can lead to learning problems, like speech leading to a reading disorder, for example, or language leading to a reading disorder. Um, but they're often, it, they're multiply determined, I suspect. Okay. Now, are they, are they frequent? I mean, I feel like as a, as a parent, of a child, if you are a parent of a child who has a learning disability, they feel common to you. Um, but how common are they in the general pediatric population? Yeah. So um, there are, I, I pulled a little data on this one as well, but so <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we're, I'm a psychologist, but so 7.2 million children between the ages of three and 21 receive special education services in our country. Um, and a majority of those, probably around 30% are getting services for specific learning disability. So they're the majority of the children receiving special education in our public school districts are those with, with learning disorders. The exact prevalence, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not yeah. entirely sure. Right. And I, I assume a lot of kids probably go undiagnosed um, without having a specific label or title added to their, their struggles with learning. So absolutely. Um, okay. So I think the better question is, as a parent, I mean, what would be some signs that your child may have a learning disability or difference in the way that they are processing and learning this information? Sure. The I feel like most children um, want to try and do their best, but when you're getting a lot of resistance from your kids with school, especially early on when kids are really small um, and you don't really get that resistance in general. Um, so your kiddo's pretty easygoing, but when you ask them to do their homework or sit down and read with you, it's just really something that they want to avoid. Um, I think that's a, a sign that we need to look into that further. Um, if you're, obviously if your teacher is 
reporting concerns that your child's struggling to keep up with peers. Um, if your child's complaining about um, school academics, I think it's worth sitting down and really trying to understand if there's something going on. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, we, we, we're not supposed to officially compare our kids to each other, but we do all the time. <laughs> so, all the time. Yeah. I do it every day. All the time. <laughs> no way not to. Um, yeah. So if you're noticing that something's not kind of going on the same trajectory of mm -hmm. some of your other children as well. Absolutely. Okay. So there, you mentioned um, in that federal definition of learning disabilities that there were a couple different types of them. Can you go through them and explain them a little bit and like maybe how they would present differently compared to the other uh, versions of them or other types of them? Sure. We kind of break them down into um, reading disorders, um, math disorders, and written language disorders, those kind of three broad categories. And then there are nuances within each one. Okay. So within reading, you can have a reading comprehension issue or a, a, a reading fluency issue so that you're not reading um, quickly enough in order to get the information into your head, for example. Written language disorders are things truly like spelling, which there are less resources delivered um, through the special education districts I'm noticing for spelling these days, purely spelling disorders. Um, written language is kind of the most comprehend or co complex one. It's really tricky to know what's affecting written language problems as kids get older, because it could be related to reading, of course, or comprehension or language or even executive functioning, planning and organization. Um, and then math disorders are often broken down into um, calculation versus applied or math problem solving. Okay. How would you go about diagnosing these and especially teasing out when you were talking about some of them are more challenging because there's multiple levels to, uh, uh, to going through that evaluation? Absolutely. So the school districts really are our first line of defense here. Um, there are several reasons for that. Um, one, the hope is to get intervention going before anything, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were changes made in the federal um, regulations of, of diagnosing and identifying learning disorders years ago that has made it easier for kids to get intervention even before we've gone through an evaluation process, for example, mm -hmm. if you see a, a student struggling. But if you are concerned about your child's learning, definitely speak with the teachers, see what concerns they notice at school, and then going further, and you can always request an evaluation um, and get just sort of bring a team together um, at school to really learn what is the process for getting my child either additional service or actually pursuing an evaluation. The evaluations through the school districts are often um, very comprehensive and include IQ testing and academic achievement. The old kind of general rule was that if your IQ is here and your learning or academic achievement is here, that means that your learning isn't quite up to your potential. So that would be a disability or a disorder. Um, that's changed a little over time, but it is true that if children, um, I, th I think one caution to that is that as children with significant learning disabilities present without remediation, their IQs can fall and match that over time. And the reason being, of course, that we're not getting enough information in children's heads sometimes. It's not that children are actually declining from an ability level, but academic okay. instruction is how we get the information in. A excellent. Um, how would you explain um, this disability or differences to a child? Because um, I think that is probably something that a lot of parents face as they're going through this with their child, because I think the child already knows that they are struggling in school. And how do you present it in a way that doesn't affect their self-esteem or their identity? Sure. I find that many times, especially really good parents, are in there trying to um, almost make kids feel like they're not different, even though things might be a challenge. So really important for me, for parents to know it's okay to acknowledge when things are a challenge for your child. So if a child says, I'm just bad at reading, it's okay to say, I know it's hard. It's just harder. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get you some resources. Yeah, you're going to mm -hmm. get you some resource for that. So you don't have to say, yep, it's awful and then leave it alone but <laughs> which sometimes I feel like doing with my own children but you do say yes this is hard for you it's harder for you I get it and so let's get you some assistance with that um and so I think just saying it like it is and that this is you know we all do have strengths and weaknesses and so reading is not an area of strength will again kind of work toward that um and work on it with you um but I think 
just simply acknowledging that some people have learning strengths and weaknesses. I really like that strategy because I do I, I do sometimes encounter families that really don't want us to bring up anything in front of their child that that talks about their child having any differences and stuff like that. But the kids kids know that there's something going on and, it, and I think it creates more fear and anxiety for them if we're not actually talking about what, what we're doing and how we're helping. Um, so I really like that approach. Yeah. And even if parents don't know how to help, right? Yeah. You can still reinsure, reassure that we're going to find the resources yeah. that we can. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's a great time as a parent to admit that you don't know what's going to happen, right? <laughs> That's right. But I'm going to try and I'm going to be your advocate and I'm going to be here to help you and support you and be in your corner. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so if, if, if school testing isn't an option, um, like you mentioned, dyslexia, sometimes not something that's uh, necessarily part of the evaluation in school districts, how can parents find, find testing and find um, supports to help their child um, to make up for the struggles that they are having um, with learning? Yes. So dyslexia itself, um, I call that one out because we get a lot of questions about that mm -hmm. one, is a medical term for developmental reading disorder. <laughs> um, and so really dyslexia, that term doesn't necessarily get used by schools. It's a medical diagnosis, but developmental reading disorders absolutely are assessed through the school district and and well, they're assessed well there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the schools should be leading the way with the evaluation quite honestly, they're often not covered. These evaluations for purely concern about learning issues are not often covered by medical insurance. Um, when they do, however, become covered are when there's a concern about potential attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or some other type of processing issue that isn't purely academic, that's mm -hmm. affecting academics. And so then that, at that point, it becomes a differential or, mm -hmm. um, and that's when medical insurances can kick in. So if you've had an evaluation through school, for example, um, and resources, but the child's still not making progress, mm -hmm. beautiful time to reach out to the medical community and see if we can do a more thorough or at least broader evaluation of other things that could be going on for the child. I want to go back to a point that you made because I think this is um, often, often something that even doctors don't understand is the difference between what schools can diagnose and what can be diagnosed in the medical center. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. Yeah. The, so we do diagnosing in the medical world. The school does looks for um, behaviors essentially that can be that that are meet criteria for categorization for mm -hmm. service. So they're okay. looking for qualifications. Mm -hmm. um, and there are several um, specific categorizations that children can qualify for special education services. And that's really their job. So if we do an evaluation on the outside and we say this child meets criteria for a learning disorder in any area, um, we still, will want and need the school to do their own evaluation process. Mm -hmm. They may use our test data, um, but they will um, do, broaden it out in the areas they need. They'll do observations. They launch an evaluation in order to determine the qualification. This happens a lot with reading disorder and dyslexia, for example, again, with the medical disorder versus a specific learning issue. Um, also happens with autism. There's an autism categorization in the school district, um, autism medical diagnosis on the outside. The process to evaluate those is often similar, which is why it gets confusing. Um, mm -hmm. but. Agree. My sister is a school psychologist, and I feel like she's always educating me on the process, which I very much agree or, or appreciate um, because I do, I do think it gets confusing. And if I'm confused as a pediatrician, I assume it gets confusing for my patients um, sometimes as well. So definitely. Okay, so if your child is diagnosed with some type of learning disability, uh, what can we do to help support that child? What are the evidence-based um, interventions? Sure. So there are, um, the schools do a beautiful job mm -hmm. integrating these types of things, but there are some outside resources. For example, here in Rochester, we have the Reading Center and other um, private tutors that are using um, methods such as Orton-Gillingham, which is old and longstanding um, and still very effective, um, and Linda Mood-Bell. There are these types of programs that really do target the phonics or the kind of understanding of the letter sounds and how they relate to the written sound, the written letters um, and are kind of multi-sensory based. So there are some outside resources for that in addition to supplementing at school. Um, there are also places for math as well. Um, places like... Um, 
you know, some other kinds of things like Huntington and Sylvan and those kinds of things can be helpful as well. I think it just is really important for parents to know what they're expecting out of those mm -hmm. remediation of a learning disorder versus kind of additional study skills assistance or rehearsal of information. Um, but the primary interventions really are done re mostly well through the school districts. Um, it can just sometimes be helpful to get a little bit additional instruction in that outside. Yeah, and but the one thing to keep in mind is how expensive that can be for families. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, sometimes thousands of dollars a month, depending on where they're going and what they're doing. So, um, I really like your your um, support of of really working with the schools first because there are so many in schools uh, things that they can do to kind of help that child. I've learned a lot from working with the um, educators and folks in the in the school districts over the years. And I think one of the things that um, was really confusing for me um, as the neuropsychologist is I was always recommending things like Orton Gillingham or other of those types of programs. Um, and and then my parents that of patients that I would see would hear that the school's not doing Orton Gillingham. But they are, they're just doing parts of it. And so mm -hmm. if they can't do all of the specifics because they don't have, you know, four hours a day with your child, which we wouldn't want your child spending four hours a day doing reading only instruction, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, right? So that's good. Um, they have, they pick and choose the parts that make most sense for the child. And I think that's, um, that's a really important point. Awesome. Well, let's finish up by, um, last question is about how parents can partner with uh, schools and other people in their, in their communities to help support their child. Yes, uh, you are central as you, as the parent, and but um, I would encourage each of you to remember each parent to remember that you're the child's advocate, obviously, but you're the only people that can really love them. Um, like the rest of us can't. So make sure that we're all pulling our weight as, as psychologists or as educators, and um, and then um, and will hopefully step up to the challenge in that way. Um, but being the, the the quarterback for the team, making sure that your child's needs are being met and uh, and chatting with schools, keeping you know your, the open communication with teachers. Um, and then I would encourage all of us on the outside to also re just remember that we might have opinions about that child out here, um, but they, um, we can't, in, you know, the school has their, um, their parameters and we have to respect that just like they respect ours. And so the best case scenario is where the outside providers, the school team and the parents are all on the same page and working together for those kids because um, it really is all about them. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown. That's all the time we have today. Um, you were a fabulous guest to have like usual. Um, and uh, I hope we have you back again, but sometime not in the near future because I know how busy you are right now. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thanks everyone who listened. Have a wonderful day.